We'll read from verse 1 of this chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, and reading at verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, an house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we might be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Now that is our scripture reading for this evening, and we trust that the Lord will bless his word to us. There is quite a large parenthesis in this second epistle to the Corinthians, beginning in chapter 2, where Paul tells about being at Troas. And then when we come back to chapter 7, he, he's back at Troas. He's taking up the threads again from what he'd been saying in chapter 2. And in between, there is this large bit in brackets, if you like, where he's speaking about his own ministry, his own activity, and so on. And in the little section we've read from this evening, Paul is continuing a theme that he'd begun back in chapter 4. He's thinking in chapter 4 about his frailty, his mortality. And I take it, my friends, that as you read through this passage, dead, and that he died for all, but they who live should not live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. In other words, Paul was saying, Christ's love in going to the cross makes demands on me. I cannot live a selfish, self-centered life in the light of Calvary. We used to sing it when I was young, out there among the hills, my Savior died, pierced, by those cruel nails was crucified. Lord Jesus, thou hast done all this for me. Henceforward I would live only for thee. And so as you go down the chapter, a whole list of things that motivated him. We're ambassadors for Christ, he'll tell us further down. And the dignity of ambassadorship was another thing that caused him to be earnest in his service for the Lord. And another little thing that we read in our passage right here, the fact of the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. My beloved, there's a day of review coming. And in light of that day when our service will be assessed and when rewards will be apportioned, it's important for us to be in the business of pleasing God. But in this little section that we read, in the main, Paul is thinking of his mortality. He's not going to be here forever. The sands of time will run out someday. What's he going to do with his little life? How is he going to employ himself during the days he's here on planet Earth? And he shows us that he's going to be involved in the service of God. As I say, the theme starts back in chapter 4, where he speaks of himself 
and the likes of you and me as just being like an earthen vessel. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And he's saying we're fragile. We're frail. We're vulnerable. Just like an earthen vessel. Do you remember Jeremiah took a vessel with the elders of the people and he crushed it against the rocks and it was in smithereens. And an earthen vessel is just so very, very delicate. And that's just like us. Frail, mortal beings. And yet, there has been committed to as a treasure. And it's wonderful to think that God uses people who are just so frail. And through them, his power is manifested. So if the gospel triumphs, it is not as a consequence of the frail earthen vessel, but rather it's the power of God that has come into play, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So he speaks about us being earthen vessels, and as you come down chapter 4, he'll go on to say about our outward man. And the outward man is perishing, he's saying, but the inner man is renewed day by day. There's a part of us that is immaterial and intangible, and that that's within can be buoyant and encouraged, even although there may be frailty and deterioration as far as the outward man is concerned. Now, those of us who are at the top end of life, we should be taking courage from that. You know, it's quite a wee while since we've realized that it's downhill all the way, really. Downhill all the way. And in spite of the fact that it's downhill all the way, the inner man can be encouraged and buoyed up. So that's what he's speaking about at the end of chapter 4. And then he begins to use a different metaphor in chapter 5. And I just want to go through these verses with you. He says, we know that if this earthly house of our tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. And he likens our bodies just to being like a tent. Remember I spoke of the earthen vessel as being fragile. Well, a tent is something that's flimsy. It can get blown away in the wind and so on. Now, I've never, I've never been a camper. I've never slept under canvas in my life, except it was in a gospel tent and we had a back part a portion for the sleeping quarters and so on, but I've never been under canvas in my life, and I'm not going to start at this age, I can tell you. But, you know, a tent is so very, very flimsy in comparison to us. And Paul uses that to just communicate to us again how vulnerable we are. I think it's wonderful to see the way in which the New Testament epistles very often glean things from the Acts of the Apostles, from the places where these, locate, the, these churches were located. For example, and I'll just throw this out to you, the Philippian epistle. How often it refers back to Acts 16, the number of things that are mentioned in the Philippian epistle. I'll just mention one or two things. You'll discover in Acts 16 there's an emphasis on gain. The masters of that young girl they saw that the hopes of their gain was gone. And Paul lifts that. And he says, to die is gain. And whatsoever things were gain to me, them I counted lost for Christ. There's a man there in the dungeon who comes and he calls for a light, the Bible says. And Paul says to the Philippians, you Christians ought to be lights in a dark world. Luminaries in a dark world. He says, be blameless, harmless, the children of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And so you go down Acts 16. I, I, won't, I won't pursue that. But you turn the page to chapter 18. And in chapter 18, Paul's at Corinth. And the first thing we're told about him is he got a job. He got a job at Corinth. What kind of job did he get? A tent maker. He's a tent maker. And now he's going to tell us about tents in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And then in Acts chapter 18, they drag him before Galio's judgment seat. And three times over the term, the judgment seat is used there in Acts 18. 
And Paul says, I'm going to use that as an illustration. And so he'll tell us here, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And so you'll discover that things that are there in the historical narrative of what took place at Corinth are drawn out and used illustratively as he writes to the church of God, which is at Corinth. And so it's the illustration of a tent he's using here. And he says, we know, we know, we know. I tell you this, you don't know everything about the future. I've sat around supper tables, you know, and the way the discussion has been going, you would think that some of the men there, they know everything about the future. But the Bible tells us quite specifically that we don't. For example, John will tell us in 1 John chapter 3, we don't know. It doesn't appear what we shall be. You know, it's not all spelled out for us. But one thing we do know is, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. But we can't just press all the pieces of the jigsaw into place. We don't know it all, so don't let pretend that we know it all. But Paul is saying here, here's something we do know. We know that if this earthly house of our tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God. In other words, he's saying, you Corinthians, I've taught you all about this already, back in chapter 15 of the first epistle. Well, he wouldn't have called it 1 Corinthians 15, but we do. And back in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, I taught you all about it. The changed body, the mystery that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. We know about the change of the body for living saints, and we know about the resurrection of sleeping saints. We know, says Paul, oh, my dear brethren and sisters, let us be encouraged with the things that we know for certain from the Word of God. So he calls this an earthly house of our tabernacle. It's earthly in contrast to the house which is from heaven. It's earthly because God has given us a body suited to the environment in which we live. And that's another point that Paul makes. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, God gives a body that is suitable for the environment. And so birds, they're feathered because they're, they're going to have to fly and, and they've got wings and, and they've got a suitable body. And fish, their body is completely different from ours, suited for the marine sphere. And folks like you and me, a body, suited, an, earthly, an earthly house. That, of course, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. And this earthly house would have no possibility of surviving in a celestial sphere. And so there's going to have to be a change. And my dear brethren and sisters, when the Lord Jesus comes, that change will be instantaneous. When I was a wee fellow in the Sunday school and in the meetings, I'm still a wee fellow, by the way. Uh, you know, they were having to put this down to accommodate a midget here tonight again. So anyway, what, but when I was a young fellow, and they used to tell me about the rapture and the fact that the Christians will be caught up. You know, the childish mind had a look at the ceiling and the roof and wondered, however, however could they get pulled up through the ceiling and, and through the roof? But then, of course, as you get a bit older and you read a bit more of the Bible, you discover that the change takes place in an atom of time, and then they're caught up. And our bodies are going to be like his body of glory, the Bible tells us. And you will remember that in his resurrection body, he passed at will through locked doors. No such thing as a physical barrier as far as the, the changed body is concerned. And so the ceiling and the roof is no problem because in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, there will be the change. Now, I know that we sometimes relate that to the suddenness of his coming. He will come suddenly. There will be no forerunner as with his first coming, as John Baptist prepare the way of the Lord. No, no, no indication he's coming within a week or a month or within six. No, no. 
He's coming quickly, he tells us, at the end of the, 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 the Bible. But as far as this in a moment is concerned, that has to do with the change of our bodies. That's what it's relating to. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So it is an earthly house in the here and now, unsuited for that heavenly sphere, but there will be the change. And one moment we're here and the next we're there. And what a day that will be. This earthly house of our tabernacle, it's going to be dissolved, perhaps. Maybe a better word would be destroyed someday. If the Lord hasn't come, the tent pegs will be pulled up. And the ropes will be wrapped up. And the canvas will be folded up. The earthly house of the tabernacle will have been destroyed. I've referred to Philippians 3 already. It's a body of humiliation. It is subject to disease. It is subject to deterioration. It is subject to death. That is one of the reasons why you can discount the theory of evolution. They're always thinking of progression. Whereas it's deterioration that the Bible speaks about. I remember years ago passing an old-fashioned mini, you know, one of the real old box-type minis, and on the back of it it said, when I grow up, I want to be a Rolls-Royce. Now, you would know that would never happen in a million years. You know, a, a car would never evolve into being something bigger and better and more sophisticated, never would. That old car doesn't exist at this moment in time. Oh, it, I know, I know from the science class that there's such a thing as the indestructibility of matter. So it exists somewhere, either in a gas form or something, because it would rust away and the rust would become a gas and so on. But it's deterioration, it's downhill. And so we don't believe in evolution. No progression, but rather deterioration. And thus it is, even with the human body, says Paul, it, it, it'll be dissolved. It'll be destroyed. And so should that be, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands. And as far as the resurrection body is concerned, not a tent, but a building. Not earthly, but it's in the heavens, and it will never be destroyed or dissolved. It's eternal in the heavens. You see, I've, I've quoted already that our bodies are going to be like His body of glory. And what does the Bible say about the Lord Jesus Christ? He lives in the power of an endless life, an indissoluble life, and our life will be as His is, and our bodies will be as His is. And so it's wonderful to think of the eternity of the, the changed body. It is eternal in the heavens. Now he says, in this we groan. I'm sure that every time you've heard a preacher expound this passage of Scripture, they've said to you, it doesn't say, in this we moan. It says, in this we groan. Now, I'm only saying that in case you would be disappointed that I didn't say it, having heard it so often. But, you know, it doesn't say, in this we moan. In this we groan. And it's speaking of the fact that we are part of a groaning creation. The fact that we become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ does not make us exempt in any way from the issues that affect everyone in this life. And Romans chapter 8 depicts the whole of creation as having been subjected to vanity at the fall. God made a decree that there would be deterioration as far as creation is concerned. 
and even an inanimate creation and the animal creation. There is within it this longing for something better and for something grander, and the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain until now, and they're anticipating something. They're anticipating the manifestation of the sons of God, says Romans 8, and that the manifestation of the sons of God, there will be a tremendous change in the whole of creation. And so you'll discover that the desert will blossom like a rose. I understand that that word rose is the autumn crocus. I'm not a great gardener, but I think it's a good testimony for a, for a Christian to keep their garden tidy, by the way. Don't have a lot of old wrecked cars and ancient washing machines lying about in your garden because that's a bad testimony. It's important to keep it tidy. But at the same time, I wouldn't class myself as a gardener. But I do know this. You expect the flowers to start blooming about this time of the year. And when it comes to the autumn, they're beginning to fade and, uh, and they're beginning to get brown. But the autumn, the autumn crocus, the desert, the desert shall blossom like an autumn crocus. So where you wouldn't expect it, in the desert, and when you wouldn't expect it even, in the autumn time, there will be fragrance and there will be fruitfulness because the groaning creation will be out of tune no longer. And instead of the, 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 instead of the thorn will come up the fir tree and instead of the briar, the myrtle and so on, the curse removed. Wonderful to think about that. And the animal creation attuned to the fact that a beneficent ruler is on the throne of the universe. And the lion will eat straw like an ox. It will lose its carnivorous characteristics. And the, the wolf and the lamb shall lie down together. And little children will be able to handle reptiles without being endangered in any way. And it will all take place when the Lord Jesus rules in this world. And that's what creation is waiting for, craning the neck, expecting it. But it won't happen for creation until the manifestation of the sons of God. Creation's groaning will not cease until the manifestation of the, of the sons of God, when the Lord Jesus comes in power and great glory. Our groaning is going to cease before that. Our groaning will cease not at the revelation, but at the rapture. Oh, presently in this we groan, and we have an expectation, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Paul kind of mixes his metaphors, but that's okay. We weren't allowed to do it at school, but... It's no problem as long as it's inspired in the Word of God. He's thinking of a building and, and yet being clothed upon with that building. Well, I, I brought my coat tonight. You know, when you come from a sunny climb away south here, you know, you need your coat when you come to the meeting. And at the end of the meeting, I'll put my coat on. I'll be clothed upon as I leave the hall this evening. Now, in a spiritual sense, when the Lord Jesus comes again, living believers will be clothed upon with that house that is from heaven. And so in that moment of time, there will be the changed body. Not a new body. I don't think we could call it a new body. That would give the impression that it's something completely divorced from what was there before. There's a distinct relationship between this body and the changed body. I think that's clear from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But it's changed. 
the word of God tells us. And so he clothed upon with our house, which is from him. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Now, he's thinking of the fact that there is the possibility that we could die. And our spirits, our naked spirits will be in the presence of God, not embodied at all. Now, Paul's saying that that's not my preference here. We saw yesterday from Philippians chapter 1 that if it was to depart to be with Christ rather than remaining and serving in this world, his preference would be to depart to be with Christ. But in this passage, if it's a preference between being clothed upon at the rapture or having to die and his naked spirit being in the presence of God, his preference would be to be clothed upon, to survive to the rapture. That would be his preference. But as we saw yesterday, there's no particular advantage in that. But here he says, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. So he says, we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. And he's added another thing, being burdened. Life can become burdensome. The infirmities of the body can become burdensome to the people of God. I've said already, because we are believers does not mean exemption from the problems of life. That is why what we call the prosperity gospel is really such a disgraceful thing. Giving people the impression, if you trust Christ, the career will take off. If you become a Christian, then inevitably the business will prosper. Sickness, you don't need to worry about sickness if you get saved. And if you do fall sick, you just come to us and we'll anoint you with a little drop of oil and lay hands on you and everything will be hunky-dory. And it's a fallacy. And in particular, in the great continent of Africa, many people are taken in by that. And in fact, poor people are being fleeced as a consequence of the propagation of our prosperity gospel. I tell you, friends, in New Testament times, in becoming a Christian, people were risking all. The, the, the Hebrews, you had to take joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Maybe they had been wealthy Jews, and now everything they possessed had been confiscated because they trusted prosperity gospel. For them, getting saved spelt poverty. So it's clear from the word of God that the Bible never, never presents the promise of any kind of material or physical prosperity as a consequence of trusting Christ. And Paul says, there's the possibility that we could be burdened, burdened. And sometimes along the pathway of life, there are the burdens that afflict the people of God. Of course, we're taught in the Old Testament even how to handle these burdens. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain thee. And when you come to the New Testament, casting all your care upon him, your anxiety upon him, for he careth for you. I remember one time I was trying to expound First Peter chapter 5, and I came to verse 7, and I said something like this. We've got two words here. We've got the word for care meaning anxiety, your anxieties. And you cast your anxieties on him. And there's the other word for care, he care. And it's the word for the care of interest and affection. And I said, maybe a loose translation of that would be, it matters to him about you. Our dear brother Edmund Ewan was in the congregation that night. And he said to me afterwards, he said, see what you were saying there about it matters to him about you. And you said it's a kind of loose translation. And the man who had Greek at his fingertips told me, that's not a loose translation. That is a very accurate way of expressing the meaning of that word. It matters to him 
about you. That's how to handle our burdens. We cast the anxiety on the Lord, for it matters to him about you. But Paul's saying here, we have these burdens. We that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. It's not that we are anticipating death. It's not that we're going to welcome death particularly, but rather we want to be clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. And friends in Christ, when the Lord Jesus comes and we are clothed upon with that house from heaven, mortality will be swallowed up in life. Our bodies are described as a mortal body, a body that is subject to death. That was the thing that came with the fall. If you eat this, dying, you'll surely die. And so scripture says, by one man, sin came into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Now, just by the way, see where it says there in Romans 5, they'll all have sinned. That is not a replica of Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that relates to your personal sin, your personal misdemeanors, the things that you have done wrong, all have sinned. But when Romans 5 and 12 says, all sinned, the context there is that when Adam sinned, you were implicated. All sinned in Adam when he sinned. As the representative, as the federal head of the human race, he instigated that rebellion against divine authority. And everyone coming in his line is caught up with that, the solidarity of the race. I could illustrate it from Hebrews 7. You remember that Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham. And the writer to the Hebrews says, now that proves that the Melchizedek priesthood is superior to the Aaronic priesthood. Because what Abraham did in acknowledging Melchizedek and in allowing himself to be blessed by Melchizedek, well, it's demonstrating that Melchizedek's superior. And that means superior to everyone that comes in Abraham's line, the solidarity of a race. It means that Levi and Aaron are inferior to Melchizedek because Abraham took that position. Now, maybe I'm not getting the point over, so I'll try and illustrate it further with something that you might be familiar. Those of you who are older will be familiar with this. You remember Prime Minister Heath? back in the 70s. And Prime Minister Heath decided to take us into Europe. We're out again, of course. Uh, and maybe it kind of spoils my illustration, but he decided to take us into Europe. And a lot of people then, as now, were saying, we don't want to be Europeans. We're content to sing Rule Britannia. You know, that's the way we want it. But a man acting as our representative took us in. And everyone was implicated because someone acting as our representative took us in. In the same way, my friends, someone acting as our representative took us in to a state of sinnership. When Adam disobeyed God, and so all sinned. When Adam sinned, death, death passed upon all men for that all sinned. When Adam sinned. And so death is something that's common to the whole of humanity, believers included. And so Paul is saying here, look, there's mortality. 
and elsewhere, we have a mortal body. It's subject to death, but there's coming a day when mortality will be swallowed up of life. And it's almost an echo from 1 Corinthians 15, isn't it? When Paul is saying, this mortal shall put on immortality. This corruptible shall put on incorruption. In other words, the corruptible, the bodies of those who've died and they've gone to dust. Well, when there's the shout and the trumpet sound, that corruptible will become incorruptible. A raised body, a changed body. And this mortal, believers who are still alive, and their bodies are still subjected. But suddenly, the body's put on immortality. When the Lord Jesus, there's the change, you see, when he comes. And when this corruptible shall put on incorruptible, incorruption, and when this mortal shall put on immortal, then, then shall be brought to pass the same. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? I sometimes hear it quoted at the funeral services around an open grave. Kind of hollow to hear it then. Death has just claimed another victim. And yet we're saying, O oh, death, where is thy sting? No, it's not just so appropriate in circumstances like that. The Word of God makes clear when that will be appropriated, for appropriate. When this mortal shall put on immortality, when this corruptible shall put on incorruptible, then, then shall come to pass the saying, death is swallowed up of victory. And so there's almost an echo of that here, isn't there? when he speaks about mortality being swallowed up of life. And that phrase, swallowed up, it, it, it kind of conveys how effective and complete the thing is. You know, it would nearly remind you of Moses' serpent, you know, when he threw the rod onto the ground, and then the magicians did the same, but you know, this serpent that emerged from Moses' rod, it, it swallowed up these other ones, didn't it? Swallowed them. Just showed how absolutely superior divine power was to demonic power. And in the same way, life will swallow up death in that coming day when the Lord Jesus comes again. Now he says in verse 5, he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God. And so God has a great purpose in saving individuals. I know that the night you got saved, you were just glad to be sure you weren't going to hell anymore. And you were happy that your sins were forgiven. And you hadn't a clue about the most of what God was beginning to do in your life. You know, Mr. Hunter, who was quoted the other day, he used to tell us, you know, the night I got saved, I became a priest. Nobody told me that. Nobody, nobody told me that. You know. The night I got saved, this happened. Nobody told me that. You know. The night I got so, nobody told me that. So the night we got saved, we just didn't fully understand all that was happening. No, we didn't. But this is teaching us that God had begun a work, and He has wrought us. He's been at work in us with this ultimately in view. The people of heaven with hope resembling his son. I think Romans 8 maybe makes it just a little more clear. It tells us there that whom he did foreknow, them obviously he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Thrilling to think, my friends, that God had a great plan in his heart and he wanted folk like you and me to resemble his son and to be in glory with him. So he's at work. The one who has wrought us for the self-same thing is God. Now, is there any guarantee that we're going to enjoy all this future blessing, a changed body, glorification, and so on? 
any guarantee? Well, he tells us, he has given us the earnest of the Spirit. So right here and now, we possess the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God resident within us is the guarantee of all these future blessings. When you go to the epistle to the Ephesians, you'll discover that when you believed, upon believing, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of God, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Now, that really cuts at the root of any kind of doctrine that really teaches you'll get the Holy Spirit subsequent to being saved. There's no gap between believing and receiving the Holy Spirit. The tense of the verb in Ephesians 1 is upon believing, upon believing. And the question is asked in John's Gospel about the Holy Spirit, and John explains that the Spirit that he would give, that he would give to as many as believed. So believing brings the Holy Spirit of God. In the Galatian epistle, the question is posed, receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? A rhetorical question. What he was saying was, you receive the Spirit by the hearing of faith. So when you believed in the Lord Jesus, that instant, the Holy Spirit came to reside within you. And says Paul in Ephesians, a seal. That is, you've got the mark of ownership upon you. God is saying, that man, that woman belongs to me. I seal them. The Spirit resides within them. But not only is the Holy Spirit the sign of divine ownership, but he's the earnest of our inheritance, the guarantee of all these future blessings. So somebody put it this way. The Holy Spirit is the seal. I am property. I belong to God. The Holy Spirit is the earnest. I have property, and it's reserved in heaven for me, says Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1. And the Holy Spirit of God is the guarantee that I'll enter into that inheritance. We sometimes illustrate it from the story of Rebecca and the unknown, unnamed, not unknown, but unnamed servant was escorting her across the desert. Interesting, I was speaking yesterday about eminence. You know, you don't read a thing about that journey. In the one verse, she's leaving her home. And in the next verse, there's a man coming to meet her. And there's nothing in between. But we sometimes think about that journey. And if you'd said to Rebecca, Rebecca, this man has been telling you about the wealth of his master's encampment. Can you believe a word of it? He's telling you that if you get married to his master's son, then you will be a wealthy woman. Everything will be the very best. Are you not a bit gullible? But on her person, there were jewels that the man had presented back there in her home country. And every time the sun would have glinted on these jewels, she would, I'm going to a place of wealth and security. She had the guarantee. She had the earnest. Now, my dear brethren and sisters, we have the earnest of our inheritance. And so in this context, the Holy Spirit is the earnest, the guarantee of this great change that will be effected when the Lord Jesus comes and we will have this body, this house that is from heaven. Now, if I press on here, I could keep you for a long while, but I think it would be best not to do that because... As I often say, if you preach too long the first night, they don't come back. And so I think possibly we should maybe draw the line. My wife always tells me, you know, if the meeting finishes at a certain time, you've got to remember 
There's a prayer, and some of the men pray long, but I'm responsible for the praying tonight, and I won't pray long, but there's the hymn as well. So it does need a few minutes just to, to wind up properly. So I think we'll leave it at that. And uh, perhaps tomorrow night we'll come back at that point and just press on through some of these verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's pray then and ask the Lord's blessing. <laughs>